And here we are. Uh, this is uh, NMVC15. My name is Nelly, and welcome, welcome to the second uh, webinar for the third day of uh, the conference. Uh, you're invited to uh, join us and spread the word. People will be coming in as we go. Uh, we were in another session, so it takes time to go from one to the other. I'm thinking of having one room open for the whole day. Um, you know, I think uh, it can be done for at least eight hours, and eight hours is enough so that we don't have to go from one room to the next. I think it'll save time. So that's an idea for uh, perhaps uh, next year for MMVC 116. So hello, everyone. If you could just uh, add in the chat box uh, where you're coming from, um, if it's morning, noon, or night, and anything about the weather that's pleasant or unpleasant, <laughs> uh, whatever the case uh, may be. About our presenter, Agile Bill Krebs uh, has been um, performing, I guess, and learning and uh, providing Agile training. Um, I think, uh, Bill, you'll have to explain a bit about that and coaching to over 2,000 people. I think it's a lot more than that um, in the 20 years that you've been um, doing this. If you think about it, I'm sure it's more. He has a grand slam of advanced Agile certifications as well as certifications and in facilitation, innovation games, and coaching. I like coaching because I think that's the way to go. If you're not familiar, there's a new term called uh, learning coaches. Now <laughs> there are coaches in schools who uh, help everybody learn. Uh, he served on the board of uh, Rock Cliff since 2010. He's hosted lots of conferences in Agile Worlds, Artful Angelus, and uh, Play Camp online. You can see uh, the rest of it. He's currently um, hosting the Distributed Agile Study Group that we'd like to become part of. So I hope you'll tell us all about that. And of course, uh, it's an honor and privilege to have you with us. And anyone who's not here right now, and I'm going to be twitting this and uh, inviting people because they don't realize what's happening, then they're missing out because I think a live makes it um, really, really uh, exciting. So I'm going to pass on the um, mic to you. There we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, test ten. Very good. Uh, how's my sound quality, by the way? Test, test. I'll give you... I'm using a uh, large diaphragm condenser microphone with a uh, pop filter <laughs> and a digital audio converter. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's hopefully that does the job. And I'm wired, hardwired into the internet, uh, so you don't have any uh, blips from wireless uh, artifacts. So that's good. And uh, I have to show you my audio converter. Of course, I have two of them. So when I'm not teaching you about uh, MOOCs, or you're not teaching me, then I can I play the keyboard or play with my Lego. Okay. So that's a little bit about me. I just gave you my bio by showing you my 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 books. Um, so I do that on purpose. That's uh, best practice. I find it online. Think about your background and maybe let people into your your space so they feel a little comfortable. Okay, that's me. It's Agile Bill. You got the bio. Thank you, Nelly. I'm excited to talk to you today because we're doing it all wrong. What? Yes, it's true. Um, we have had for 10 years or more, some tools available um, for greater engagement. But they're very hard to use. When people master them to come in to use these tools, what's the point? Uh, they don't see the benefit. And I think that's because we're using the tools wrong. So I'm hoping that uh, today we can learn a bit about some new ways to teach um, 
and just get you thinking about uh, how that might look. Okay, so um, now I gave you my bio. The most significant part is all the certifications I get, I make a word search puzzle out of them. And uh, I need a K. So there's a lot that have P uh, and S in there, but I, I don't have any Ks. Um, I'm actually a graduate student at Boise State. Okay, um, I picked the word andragon. And because I like andragogy, I like working and teaching adults, I like shapes, like polygons, so I smushed them together. Uh, the idea here is it's a shape to help you do your teaching or your work. I don't know if I like that as much. I'm thinking about maybe changing to actagon because they need to be interactive. It's not just about passive observation. You need some proactive interaction. Um, so when you teach, what does it look like? Right now I've got my office and I've got WizIQ. WizIQ being a very nice tool for this. Um, I purposely showed you my office. That was a use of the camera. Uh, or do you teach in a physical classroom? And are the seats lined up like a church? Or are they divided like a courtroom? Probably not. Are they in an amphitheater style? Semicircle, excellent. How do you like the semicircle? You can answer in chat. Does that work well for you, putting it kind of in a semicircle? I actually love that you did that because that has completely different meaning, doesn't it? Yeah, Nelly has a full circle in class too. So if you're surrounded by people, you know, the teacher has to engage. I think the seating layout that you guys are describing there. Uh, has a big effect not just on the students but also the teacher. Uh, I had a teacher that said statistically people get higher grades if they sit in the front rows. So he actually made the class only three rows deep. <laughs> you know, it was a wide thing, but it, everyone was sitting in the first few rows. Sense of equality, like Knights of the Round Table, right? If you're in a circle or semicircle. So those psychological aspects translate both to the effect on the learner and also the teacher. If I'm teaching in Nelly's circle, I'm going to be looking around to make sure I'm engaging everybody. If I'm teaching on a webcam, you know, I kind of look at myself, and that helps me. If I don't even have that, if I don't have the webcam and I'm just reading the slides, if I just see the slides, I'm very tempted to read them, which is perhaps the worst. So my question is, Do you feel constrained by the classroom and chairs? What if you could use something else? What if you didn't have to have the tables and chairs in one physical room? What would you invent? Well, these are some people, I, I saw them last week at the top conference in, in my little agile niche here. They're uh, professional coaches and they do um, training and coaching they're the top of the food chain, you know, my, uh, Lisa Adkins and Michael Spade. So I built a custom classroom for them using Unity and Jive, which are a couple of virtual worlds. And I made a little movie of the training and all that. And what I did is I bought this arena build for $10. And I added my own special content. And I could even program it. So if you walk here, it moves you, teleports you to another classroom. But the most interesting thing is the way they teach in uh, physical classes in real life. They actually put some blue painter's tape on the floor. And rather than just sitting in the seats of the class, they walk around. And the lesson they're teaching is that as a professional coach, you have four stances. You're not always uh, giving information. Like right now, I'm preaching at you. I'm, I'm telling you what I know. That's a teaching stance, and that's good. But sometimes you leave your expertise at the a door, and you switch over into a coaching stance. What I'm doing there is I'm asking you questions. Because uh, I'm going to say, I think you know the answer, but you might need some help and structure to get that out. Um, 
So what 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 classes what shapes would you use? See there I'm not telling you what, what you use, I'm asking you. And then facilitation also. Sometimes I could facilitate the meeting, like Nellie's doing. She's doing a great job. She made sure I was prepared for class. Um and she she organized this. Uh, she got the meeting kicked off, but she's not saying anything about this topic. She might know a lot about this, but she's facilitating. She's in a different stance. So we're representing that lesson by walking from one corner in the physical classroom. They literally walk from this, say, hey, we're talking about teaching, bring your expertise. And then they walk over here and they say, we're talking about facilitation. Leave your expertise at the door. Now, here's the wrinkle. I teach mostly online. How can I capture that coolness so that instead of reading slides to you, we're having that feel of walking around, that kinetic feel or metaphor? So we made a virtual world. We got one, we picked one, and we literally walked. See how they, they walk from different topics in their course. Uh, we, we walked it there. That, that's what I liked about that. I don't really know if this is the best way to teach these things. But I know it's different. I always like trying something new. I know old isn't good. We were talking in chat a little bit about small desks. They help the movement. That's right. If they're huge, you can't get between the desks. No desks. What if you didn't have a desk? I think there's a John Lennon song about that. He's saying something about imagine no slides, imagine no desks. I wonder if you can. Um, and there's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the seating depends on the activity. And yes, you get the big star for that. I will click the smiley face icon. The seating depends on the activity. Who says I have to be lined up? What if I'm in a circle? What does that mean? What if I'm at small tables and groups? What does that mean? What if I'm not constrained by a physical desk at all? I can have any virtual construct I want. So I like that. <laughs> OK. So this is uh, what we did. And the sky in this classroom, should I have had a ceiling? Should it be a white ceiling with popcorn or, or like acoustical tile? Or should it be a sky, maybe with some clouds occasionally moving over, with trees visiting? I don't really know the best practices here. We need to have some hypotheses and some research to say, what is the best practice? What are the alternatives? I think that's interesting. I think that's research. Thinking here, I thought, well, let's have this open feel without too much distraction. The focus is on the walls of the arena. Who knows if it works? But that's what I want to research with you is the path. How about this one? I'm showing a picture of a classroom with a chair, slide projector, and some slides. Screen. What do you think? You know I won't let you off the slide until you tell me in <laughs> chat. What do you think about this one? Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Alejandra. It, it represents a typical classroom. My, um, my uh, thought on this is we so often go into virtual. Yeah, exactly. Someone said I look bored. Not me, but my avatar here. Yes, that is my avatar. Out of habit, really. I just out of habit, when we get a virtual classroom, we tend to give you slides. Oh, my gosh. Right? That's crazy. We are giving you the same setup that you would have in a physical classroom. So I am playing my board animation here. Those classes are not engaging. You can barely read the text. You know, Gardner, I don't know if it's statistically proven, but you know, Howard Gardner said there's just different learning styles. I think there's other people writing about learning styles. I am not a read it kind of guy. I'm more kinetic or a visual. Uh, give me a metaphor or something or a story or a song or anything but reading. 
for me. So that's not working. So that's an example of a very typical classroom setup in a virtual world that is terrible. That's like almost as bad as me pushing slides to you. So Mary says uh, she teaches anatomy and phys physiology online. We love a virtual hospital. Absolutely. Isn't that cool? What if you can have a hospital? So instead of telling you about diabetes, what if we had a hospital and we had stations where they had different lab equipment? So they do. There are schools that are doing that. In fact, I went to a heart murmur simulation. And you know, you you, you feel like a nurse, they, they put you on the in the hospital clothes, you walk up to a virtual model of a patient, um, and actually you listen, you listen to their heartbeat. And you have to diagnose, is that a collapsed valve, you know, prolapsed? Is it um, arrhythmia? Is it uh, some kind of other failure? Is a heart murmur of other kinds? So I thought that was really cool because it's contextual learning. You're interacting with other people that would be working with the patient. You can see the physical layout of the room. Okay, I know it's not a real room with hands-on, but, you know, there's some research from uh, Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Laboratory uh, that says some of these memories imprint in your brain better. You know, it kind of fools your brain into thinking you're, you're there. They actually have false memories sometimes. So, like, you can have people swim with whales, uh, children in some cases, and they remember that, even though they didn't actually do that. But using it for training, they get 17 better engagement um, just from the game aspect. You, you can structure it that way. That's data from Carl Kapp. Using virtual worlds, you can design it well. Not like this one, design it well. What can you do? They have emergency responder things. You can do a role play. It's like playing World of Warcraft but with emergency responders. So you have the patient on the floor, you have the ambulance. You know, how do you coordinate between ambulance and helicopter and police? And that's what you can learn in these kind of simulations. Kelly says that her brain picks up thoughts as reality all day long. How do I perceive that? I don't know if my brain works as well as Nellie's, but I think she's right about that, though. So let me give you a few ideas. This is one thing I tried to teach project management. I made a game board. So it's like you're playing the game of life or mousetrap or um, Monopoly. So I, I put my each facet of project management on a square on the board. And here I'm bigger than the board, so I feel safe. By feeling safe, I have pieces on the board I can manipulate. I can click on things. I can walk around the board. And I feel very safe because I'm like a giant. You know, I'm huge, and the board is kind of a toy. How would you take your subject? How would you take your hospital nurse training? And instead of walking into the hospital, what if you made that a game board, like Monopoly? What would that look like? What would your lesson, what, what would each square of your lesson plan be on the floor? Would it be in the order that the physician does the stuff? You know, one square for triage, another square for anesthesia, uh, anesthesiology. Another square for um, surgery, another square for post-op, and maybe a side room for insurance. Like, we have things we need to know and do for insurance. But yeah, so that's a board game. Now, remember, you could still do this face-to-face. -face. In fact, the um, conference I went to, our, our keynote speaker guy, Luke Holman, he's famous for innovation games. And they're great. I love them, right? We have these cards. These cards are fun. This is all good stuff. He has stuff on rules in the back. Here's your doctor. Like, you know, he's got 2020 vision. That's one of the games. It may look backwards in my camera. I don't know. Let's see. The thing is, like, I'm rarely face to face. My goal is to teach anywhere and have it be as good or better. That's why the, the virtual board thing or something like it, I think, is of interest. Nothing against face to face. You know, always be there. I just, it's not, not an option for me. Okay, let's try another one. How about a factory? A factory is uh, like uh, each station means something. 
and they've carefully ordered the stations uh, to be next to each other to be efficient. You know, where, um, where do we use this stuff? What do I need when I'm working on this kind of, in this kind of way? When I'm doing a, um, a, an IV for my patient at the hospital, what do I need around me? Do I need like a, a sheet, a sterile sheet, some gloves, some, some needles? Where are those things? Are they in this cabinet? You know, where does the trash go? So all those things together in the hospital, a hospital is kind of like a factory. In this factory, maybe I have a machine that's producing stuff. So I use this metaphor for uh, software development, project management. We come into the factory. Each room each station represents a step in our process. And they're ordered in the, set, in the same order you would need to do them. And when you're doing project management at work, you're just sitting there at your desk, talking to people on the phone, or using some computer program to track your stuff. But if you used a physical metaphor, you'd be walking between estimating, planning, another room for execution, doing it, uh, getting your updates, another room for your retrospective or lessons learned. And I wanted to include a loop because I do iterative stuff, blah, blah. But that, that's a factory because now I'm life-size compared to the environment. I can walk into this simulation and I, I feel like I'm in a room. It could be metaphor, or if it's like the hospital, it kind of represents what I'm doing. Mary mentioned that multiple senses mean more neurons equals more likely to remember. Isn't that true? Like if it's, you're hearing it from my voice, but if you can see it on the screen, and if you if you if I let you loose in there and said, okay, go walk through here and then tell me and get it right. Do you think I put the lesson modules in the right location, my virtual factory? Exactly. All styles of learners. And I have some text in there, too, because sometimes people just need to read things. You know, first, second, third, ABC, they need that order, too. That, that's okay also. Let's take a look at another one. So I didn't get enough. I love this. So in addition to going to Boise, which is in Idaho, in the western U.S., I took some classes from the University of the West of England, which is in Bristol, England. So I'm going from Western U.S. to England, and I can take those classes the same week because it's online, and it is not just watching YouTube videos and not just reading. I can get in there and do something interactive. So our project, uh, yeah, is, oh, exactly. I hope you get to experience this yourself, too. So my project for this course, the course is about building. Uh, we had to fit in a 20 meter by 20 meter high, 20 meter deep cube. We had to build something in a cube, and uh, I built the Agile Diner. So I teach um, the Agile Style Project Management. Here it is, right? So it's a diner, meaning like a restaurant. The theory being, I wanted to show you got to talk to your customers. You've got to find out what they want. So I pictured myself as a waiter, talking to my customers, and then I'm going to go down to the kitchen. The kitchen looks a lot different than the place the customers are. So I, I rely on metaphors, uh, but I also have signs in there. Hey, what's going on? So that's the Agile Diner. If you go inside, uh, I'm emphasizing the mechanics of producing what you're doing. The stove on the right, that's all about. What's hot? What's hot right now? We're going to focus on that. Don't try to worry about everything at once. Just finish, focus and finish a few. That's the lesson inside the kitchen. At the top, where I have the customers, things are nice and I can have a nice dialogue with them. Uh, and I can uh, get feedback. And is, that, is there anything wrong with your order? Let me go fix that right now. So I teach kind of a, a requirements analysis piece upstairs where it's about dialogue with your customer. In the kitchen, I'm talking about, hey, put some stuff in cold storage. Put that on literally the back burner. Focus. That's uh, some techniques of limit work in progress. Anyway. Now I showed you some virtual worlds with uh, people represented digitally with an avatar, some abstract shape. Um, but do we need the faces? Right now in this course, you're seeing my aging, wrinkly, smiling face. 
how important is that? How useful is that? I don't see your guys' faces. Um, I know what it looks like. Um, how does that work? Is it better if you're in a Google Hangout with every face or just the presenters? face-to-face -face, we get that with no lag but sometimes the audio is you know kind of a crowd talking it's a little hard i don't have to fidget with my headset or my microphone it just kind of so i'm comparing online with face-to-face -face. what are we missing why do people say online courses are not as good as face-to-face -face? is it because they don't have hands-on activities is it because they don't have the facial expression? Is it is it because they don't have the, the macro body language? Like where I sit makes a difference. You know how how do you feel when I'm speaking to you this way, or if I'm sitting like this? Right? That kind of body language. You know that's all important. That body language. Um, and I can accidentally do some, <laughs> that's right? So that's what I'm interested in. So when you get some tools, it's nice if you have these, but you have to consciously decide, am I using it? Do I have the lighting on my face or am I backlit? Am I sitting up here in an engaging posture or am I, you know, not, not with it there? Do I have cool a cool background like Nelly's books or my Lego or, or something, you know, like laundry? How's the laundry? Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't want you to feel like, um, well, I, I want to feel like I'm talking to you and not a machine and vice versa. So, um, uh, Moore has a thing called transactional distance. And I think he did, he's referring to more of the design of the interaction, like the forums and stuff like that. But I want to have a feeling of a close transactional distance. Let's give an example. What if I'm teaching you about astronomy? I could give you a nice slide like this, right? I can tell you about the polar caps, maybe some bullets on here, all of a sudden on the sun, you know, um, the moon. Do we ever get to see the other side of the moon? So this is purely text-based. Okay, well, what if I gave you a picture? I gave you a picture, and you know, here's your lesson. It's more visual, more graphic. Um, but wait a minute, would you is there any would you change anything in this diagram? So Nelly would. Anyone else see some stuff? Maybe you can make it a little better. Colors. Yeah, exactly. Colors would be good. Size. I love that. Fan says size. I put the moon is the same size as the Earth and Mars and Venus. Well, that, that's kind of silly because really they're quite different in size. Yeah, and the perspective is wrong. That's right, Mary. I kind of put them at the same distance and the same size. And in reality, you know, it would be a, a learning moment, be very instructive to have them at the correct relative size and distance. Ooh, a square world. Now, that's interesting. I like that. Throw some cognitive distance in there. See, this is why I hang out with Nelly. She's quite cool. So you could ask people, why are the planets not square? Or are they? I look out of my window, and it seems flat to me. Also, did I get the order of the planets correct? Are those in the right, you know, first, second, third order? So, um, by the way, what you can do in a virtual world is space them properly. You can grow them to the right size. Or you can program them to make them spin and rotate. And more importantly, you can have it so your students can click to make the planet spin or stop spinning. I think it's not just the spinning. I think the person who does the slides learns, of course. I think the person who creates the 3D model learns. Walking passively through your simulation, cool though it is, it's not as good as if A, you interact. You click the planet and it starts to spin. And try this. 
what if you did a cool Nelly thing and had the square and the student's job is to change it into the proper shape or give the student these these images of the planets just a flat image and say you build it so talking with Lucas Gillespie we laughed and called this constructionist education like construction like we're building something we are going to literally have our students build things to learn. Wow. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And like Nelly's thing, constructivism, that's the real thing. Jean Piaget, uh, constructivist thinkers. Yeah, deconstructivism, that's a good one. Make it a square. <laughs> that's brilliant. How would you change the reality to be different than the reality? So I need to read Nelly's paper on deconstructivism. Uh, I assume there's one out there. If not, write one. <laughs> that's a very cool idea. I'm learning my you fire made a lot of neurons fire with me thinking about square planets. And should I fix that? Or why are they not square? Or it's up to you guys to think of cool things like that. What cognitive dissonance, what metaphors, what interactions would you have in your class? You know, I think a square planet would be so cool. I think that's cooler online and face to face. I cannot buy a square globe. I can get a box and make one. I could make a square planet, cover this with, you know, picture of the Earth. That's not as cheap, though, as doing it in a virtual world. I could do that for three cents in a virtual world. Face to face, you know, the art supplies, I'm trying to find a square globe, it's actually more expensive. Now, the problem with those virtual worlds is they kind of scare people a bit because they're hard to use. Not everyone's a video gamer, so that, that whole perspective, it's a little hard to deal with. <clears throat> Sometimes the UI is very complicated. So this is one tool I use. It's called Sococo. And I can, you know, if you want to ping me, I can give you more info on it. Um, it's not just Skype. Yes, it has video. Yes, it has sound. Yes, it has a breakout room, so every person's voice is isolated in that room. Yes, it lets me share my screen. It's like having you know lots of web access going on at the same time. <clears throat> What's different here, though, is I can create a floor plan. I can create a floor plan, so it may mean that hey, I've got this teacher's office, I've got the student lounge, and I've got the formal classroom where you meet. That helps to, yeah, that helps to kind of get people, you know, set up, right? That helps people to know how they're supposed to behave. If I'm in Nellie's office, I'm going to be kind of deferring to her, listening to her, and having a little bit more interaction. Um, the other trick to it is, though, if I'm in the formal classroom, I know I'm supposed to stop and listen to the teacher. I think we can do better. What I did is I took my factory and I flattened it, or the game board. Your lesson is the floor plan. You're looking at my class. Each room represents a step in my software management process. And the relationship between the squares shows you what you do first, second, and third, what you do in parallel, and we can leap through it. I put an extra graphic at the bottom to remind you of some things for your meetings. <laughs> Thanks, my son. Yeah, that's the deal. So it's not just breakout rooms. I'm going to have you sit, you know, do your day of project management. As a teacher, I can see who's working with who, what step are you in, what room are you working with um, at that time. Are you in the estimating room? Cool. Okay. But is that the right room for people to be in? Are you doing that alone, or are other people joining you? That's why I'm excited about this, because if 3D is too hard for people, this gives you that same topology. You can create a board game or a flat factory, a nice act andragon, but it's a little easier to use. So there you go. So thanks for your, for your thoughts. You guys are giving me some bad ideas. Yeah, you know, my 3D self, 
and my physical self and my flat Sococo self are having this conversation. So, Bill, what do you think about Sococo? And my flat Bill will say, you know, it's flat. It's not as cool, engaging. I can't wave my hands. Um, I can't wear a color-coded shirt. Uh, in my case, black means I'm a coach. Uh, red I use for testers. I can't do that. Well, I can change the color of my bobblehead, but you can see I'm wearing a VWBPE lanyard, which means I volunteered or presented at that conference. Can't do that. It's Coco. Um, and then the you know the other flat bill would say, but it's enough. You know, people have a hard time going into virtual world. It's, it might be good, it might be too much noise, but they can't get in. It's too hard. My carbon-based self, but you know, I there's something about getting on an airplane and having a meal with somebody and maybe shaking their hand. I don't know. You guys decide. You know, how do you teach? You have some options. <laughs> okay. So you don't have to be constrained by those. You can also do a think tank. In this pattern, you're literally underwater. So taking advantage of the platform's graphics, the shadows are a little different color. They're more blue. They're darker. You feel like you're submerged. And um, in this one, we're, remember, Nelly said circular. So they have a circle for people. So you can call on them in a turn. And also, we have bleachers, meaning those square seats at the back, so people can simply observe. So this is a great way to facilitate, because I can walk through the speakers. They know who's coming next. And some people, it's OK if they just want to listen. That's a think tank, plus that ring. You could have a think tank with different seating, but that's kind of fun to be immersed and see the seaweed and all that. What about a campfire? I like the campfire. There's something about it. I don't know if we're instinctually trained, you know, but we know to gather around. We know to sit around the fire. We're all peers, like you guys mentioned, um, we're all equal. And we know we can take turns. We know we're going to tell stories. We learn that way. Um, one of the people in this is actually in a wheelchair and, and uh, physically, so it's hard for them to get around. But here, they're, they're equal. Uh, John Lester on the left there. He's uh, one of the ones that develops and teaches about this tool that's going to be done. Um, so campfires seem to be different and because there's a focus. If you sit in a circle without that ambient crankle of fire, that sense of safety and security from the fire that I think we remember. Uh, I'm not roasting marshmallows virtually, but I have happy memories. So I... I think there's something about a campfire that makes it a special learning shape or endergon. Oh, what do you guys think about campfires? Yeah, so Nelly likes it to the relaxing. So I think there is a mood effect too. What I mean here, you, in fact, they've done some research about you can make a beautiful vista, you can have some meditation pose and music, and you can literally lower your blood pressure in a virtual world. Conversely, you can have some stressful situations by accident or on purpose, and it would be a different emotional experience. So you have to manage your environment. Virtual campfires are good because I can turn them off quickly. <laughs> turn them on, easy to light. Another one we did is uh, hopscotch, agile hopscotch, uh, which is a game, I don't know if it's internationally played, but at least in the US, you jump between these numbered squares. And so when I run a meeting, it's supposed to be a very short meeting to give you updates on what I'm working on. So each person will take turns. You know, first thing, what did you do yesterday? Give me another thing. What else did you do yesterday? Okay. What are you going to focus on today? Give me a couple things. Then do you have anything holding you back? What's in your way? What are your blockers? The team can try to help, or if it's going to take a while, we'll, we'll cover that after the meeting. When they're done. Right? I can see that because I'm on the side of the hopscotch. When I'm ready to start, I can see that because you're standing in front of the hopscotch. So that one works pretty well. Another kind of pattern for you. Remember, I like underwater. I take advantage of all three dimensions. Uh, this game, there's a game called Speedboat. 
and you can play it online with a web application. You can play it face to face with a big piece of paper and yellow stickies. Uh, so speedboat, the idea, if your boat go fast. Don't let your boat get weighed down by anchors. But you know, just putting stickies in the wall is not as good, maybe, as visual. So I made a boat and I put digital anchors underneath that people can raise and lower, they can comment on them, they can add text. When I'm done, I can hit a button and query the location of all these things. So I'm giving it to um, I had tech, uh, 531, uh, 532 course is the project for that. I'm wearing a deep sea diver suit. Everyone else is wearing uniform from our class. That's another way to get underwater. So I think this stuff's cheaper. Think about how much it costs. I've taught courses in India. Great people, love the food. Expensive as heck to get out there. Very tiring. Burned a lot of carbon all into the atmosphere also. So one of the things that uh, John Lester said, better known as Pathfinder, is there's two things you design for. Biology. What do our instincts tell us? What, what kind of visual cues? The other one is designed for culture. Right? What am I used to culturally? I took a class in photography, you know, Nikon School of Photography, and they said the Western eye tends to follow from lower left to upper right. I hope I'm doing this right on the camera. I'm trying to do it backwards, so it's good for you. But lower left to upper right, their eye just scans things that way. So if you do a picture with that orientation, people will feel comfortable. Um, like you're taking pictures of stairs or something. But other cultures, that's not necessarily so. And you know, like, you know, Middle Eastern languages, a lot of those are written right to left. Uh, you know, so Japanese languages sometimes down. So your culture may make a difference. In terms of biology, uh, sound, we can feel rooted to a, a, a build. If there's a little water fountain, uh, you can hear some sound. And when you walk around the virtual space, I can orient because I know where that sound is. Its position is changing. Um, Sound is really important in those. You can really use that. Um, so, uh, angle. What angle are you looking at? What's the view angle? How wide is the horizon? John taught me that our, our brains have, have been designed to quickly scan the horizon so we can hunt better, we can be aware of danger. So if you have something that's tall, it's, it's kind of weird looking at it this way. You know, a lot of slides are 4 by 3, which is wide, 16 by 9, widescreen TV. It's actually wide. That's a more comfortable, that's just kind of how our brain's wired to, to scan. Um, So my goal is, you know, I don't know that I can tell you the perfect shape to make for your classroom. I just like to advocate that there's this thing called the shape of your classroom, or Andragon, and I like to make a list of them. I am hoping that you'll invent something way cooler than I will think of. Nellie Square Planet is a perfect example. I never would have thought of that. That's way cool. That's <laughs> the Nellie Gon. I don't know. It's awesome. Deconstructivism. You guys invented that. I didn't. But I'm trying to make a list uh, so we can all learn from each other and we can teach better in a virtual environment. We can teach better online because you're doing it in a um, uh, solar system of square planets inside a, literally a holodeck rather than a classroom of chairs. You know, maybe they're lined up this way or that way, but they're still chairs. What if we're sailing through? Uh, Nellie square planets in a square ship, and we can only go, you know, in compass directions. Squaresville. And then you can shift over and talk about Picasso. So I've got this list, you know, TV station, Stonehenge, uh, things that are purely simulations, Tombstone. Uh, they have a Tombstone Western uh, thing. They do a great job of orienting you, you know, special roles, special builds.
Yeah. So those are the things that give you a list of these in the slides. And that's what we talked about today. Treehouse is fun. There's actually some research on virtual worlds. Uh, Carl Kapp is just awesomely cool. Uh, he writes about games also. But his book he wrote with Tony O'Driscoll, is, that's the one. That's the one you need. Um, teaching and Learning in Virtual Worlds, awesome book. Uh, and it gives you some things to do with them and ideas. And all the other stuff's good too. Uh, I have some videos. Um, if you can find the um, link in the slides later, just type that in. And I did a conference, and uh, we did it in virtual worlds. So in some cases, people got up and they just talked and they had slides. Okay, yeah, we didn't have to travel, but epic fail. That's like, oh my gosh, you guys aren't getting it. John Lester's talk, though, was interesting by contrast. He started off with boring slides, then he had us walk around to a puzzle. And if we got the puzzle right, we were transported to an alien world. And that's the kind of thing that I teach. That's the kind of thing you can do with online tools. A little bit more about me. So, so ping me. Thank you. <laughs> I hope to hear more from you guys. Love to connect and learn, you know, from your ideas and share more ideas if I come up with any. Um, thank you very much. If I have any more, I think that's about it. Yeah. That's a wrap. Great to have you all in class. And I really appreciate Nelly for hosting these things. Um, I've learned a lot through a bunch of these courses. They are they are very good and um, smart folks. Interesting interesting topics. Any questions? Yeah, let me my, my, my Skype. Let well, me we do it this way. Um, I'll give you a couple ways to find them. That was good. I, you know, I'm always amazed by the ideas you guys have. That's a good bad designer, right? It's a diner.
Well, the next thing is um, to get Windows 10 and their uh, HoloLens. Um, you can get these stereo lenses with Oculus Rift. That's all it is. So, um, um, well, I have. Let me give you two answers. That was three three hundred dollars. But this was. Um, this does the same thing with your phone, and it was thirty dollars. <laughs> it's just cardboard. So you can build one out of cardboard and put your phone on there for thirty dollars or less. So Google Cardboard, you know, it puts the it has the lenses and it holds your phone away from your eyes like that, and um, it doesn't have as much quality. But there's other companies rushing into that space to provide those things. I think for me, because of motion sickness, I'm not sure if those really help. Or like getting to all my students would be hard. But people are going to be building things for that environment. They're going to be building things for Oculus Rift and for Microsoft HoloLens. And then I can use those just as well without the hardware. I can, I can go into some of those builds and experience your immersive simulation your square planets without that extra hardware. Just I don't see it in stereo, I, you know. So that's what I'm interested in. I didn't mention Second Life because that's like saying Kleenex. There's lots of brands of tissue paper. And much as I love Second Life, it's like 12 years old. A lot of web years, and it's used for everything. And I want to focus on things for education. So I have Open Simulator, I have Jive, I have Turf, I have um, um, I have uh, a Vilive Engage, right? I have Sococo. I have I had Cloud Party, but it's so popular it got bought. And then I pinch. Yeah, I'll use WebEx if I need to. I use WizIQ. It's fine. It's what we're doing today. But the point is, you know, they're coming out with high fidelity. So the creator of Second Life comes out and they use the camera to track your facial expressions. So your avatar's eyes will move. Long, your eyebrows will move on your avatar if you use, move yours here. Uh, connect will already track your, your hand motions. So what's next is augmented reality where we're combining the physical scanning. You know what? Just because I have a nervous tick or I accidentally move doesn't mean I want to project that in the class. In these virtual worlds I have now, I hit a button that says I want to you know, move, raise my hand. Uh, but the technology is getting better, you know, new additions to these things, new tools. I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Oh, ignore that one. Yeah, so I would... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if you're a Twitter fan, find me on Twitter. Um, we can talk more about these things and add stuff. We'll get a catalog going. I have a Google Doc. Um, I'll have to look up the address for you up there. Um, and we'll. Yeah. I'll tweet that out this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a different use case. Yeah, for for entertainment and family, go to Facebook. But for more business stuff, go to LinkedIn and Twitter. It is. That link is, yeah, that'll get you to my Twitter. Yeah.
Yeah. If you give people a birth to world and make them an honest, it's the first thing they do. They do 50 shades of education. So I just want the serious education part. That's fine if they want the other entertainment stuff. That's like a totally different. Keep that away from our business people. And that's why some worlds don't work as well as a platform like everything. That's important. Right. Exactly. Just to manage it, manage it. Yeah, manage your environment and your your students. And you know, I'm not judging it for like sports or art or or whatever. But like, this is this is for business education. This is for science education. So it's just keep them apart, and that that'll help. Great. Always a pleasure. <laughs> well, I can play Minecraft. Oh, badly. Why well, use the computer to fix everything? Oh, well, so that's that's the deal. That was great. Thanks, everybody.